Stay tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is actress-director Michelle Danner and author-poker expert Richard Sparks. Michelle Danner was born and raised in New York and went to the conservatory in Paris. She has a diverse career in the arts. In film, she uh, worked with actors Penelope Cruz, Christian Slater, uh, Selma Hayek, and Jason Alexander. And at the New York Theatre Company, where she uh, presented the works of Sartre, Moliere, Ennui, she directed Edward, uh, Eric Roberts, and uh, Francis Sternhagen, and Donald Moffat, and we could go on and on and on. But let's, Michelle, let's start with the fun part when you had a restaurant. <laughs> what I was did. that? <laughs> well, you know, my dad always said, it's good to have money come into the cash register every day. And uh, we opened a restaurant at the corner of Bleecker and Christopher Street, right by the Lucia Lortel Theater. Oh, that was cool. Yep, called Café Michel, and uh, it was the, the hardest year of my life. We had a crepe menu, 40 crepes from all over the world. And um, I realized very soon that this was not for me, the restaurant business. Is that right? Well, the day we opened, our chef called in six, so I had to go downstairs and cook, and it was the 80s. And one of my fake nails set on fire <laughs> all up and on the ceiling. <laughs> And I said to myself, oh, I don't think so. <laughs> was, that, was, it, was it easier to be directing actors on the stage? <laughs> yes, much easier. This was, uh, this was slavery work. You had to be there all the time. Why were you in Paris? I was in Paris because my father was a producer, and he started uh, with the William Morris Agency in the mailroom. And he worked his way up, and he became the president and opened the Paris branch. Oh, he did. And in the early 60s. Uh, and, and the name? Uh, my father, Alex Valdez, and he opened the William Morris Agency in Paris off the Champs-Élysées. So we went to live in Paris. So I lived in Paris for the first 17 years of my life. Oh, you lived there a long time. Yep. Oh, so you were so. basically raised um, European rather than New, New Yorkese. Yes, raised very European. And Studied Latin and Greek. So did you want to be a director what, or an actor? What were you doing in the conservatory? Well, my father said that uh, and my mother said that when I was uh, three years old and four years old, I would entertain everyone from the William Morris Agency and do imitations of Alfred Hitchcock and Ed Sullivan and Judy <laughs> Garland. And so I must have known at a very early age that that's what I wanted to do. I think you were looking for an agent. Yes, <laughs> that's exactly right. You didn't right. know you had it wrapped up, did you? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but how actually, you, you did um, direct for film, right? I had just completed a movie called How to Go Out on a Date in Queens uh -huh. with uh, Jason Alexander and Ron Perlman and Kimberly Williams and Allison Eastwood and Isai Morales that's going to come out in the next few months. Oh, you did? Yes. And Allison uh, is Clint's daughter. Yes. Because she was a model in Paris for a long time. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yes. Oh, she was on the runway. She was great. Wow. I remember seeing her then. Well, she's wonderful in my movie. Well, how do you direct these people who are so, um, I don't know, been around show business all their lives? Well, I'm an acting teacher, uh. you know, so I come from that angle. And so um, I certainly understand the craft. I've studied it my whole life. And, but this movie is my first movie. It's a very entertaining romantic comedy, and uh, it's a fun comedy. And then being at the the New York, what was it, State Theater, the New York Theater Company, Company. Um, you had seasoned actors there. Yes, I worked. We did a lot of plays off Broadway, off off Broadway. So. All of that prepared me for <laughs> what I'm doing now. Did you pick the things when you were in New York? Yes. Did you pick the we pieces? We picked all the plays, yes. Did you help cast, too? Or? Yes, all of that. Direct. All of it. 
Well, you're a member of the Directors Guild, so you obviously have directed a lot. Does it take so many pieces to get into the Guild? Well, the, the, the movie got me into the Guild, the How I to see. Go Out in Dayton Queens movie. That's the movie. That, uh, and I'm in pre-production for another movie, uh -huh. a wonderful movie called Counting for Thunder, which uh, we did it at a stage, as a stage production recently. Did you direct it on stage? I directed it on stage, and it's just a wonderful story. And uh, the Brooklyn Films, John Avnet, who directed Fried Green Tomatoes, they all came to see it, and they loved it, and now we're making a movie out of it. I mean, they saw the play. Yes. On but that's what it's so great out here, because you get that Hollywood group, don't you, coming to small theaters and seeing what's going on? Well, I think producers and directors are looking for great stories. They're looking for, you know, great storytelling. Who wrote that story? Uh, Philip Cooper, who is the actor that performed it, he performed it as a one-man show and he played all 20 different characters. Oh, that's kind of what Chaz Palminteri did that exactly. time before he was discovered. That's exactly <laughs> right. That's a good way. That's yeah. interesting. Um, so, as a teacher, what do you do? I do teach, you have classes? teach several classes in this cultural arts center. Oh, tell us about the Edgemar Cultural Arts Center. Is that where you teach your classes? Yes. It, uh, it used to be, as you said at the beginning, it was the Santa Monica Museum of Art. And, uh, but when we took it over, it was one empty space. And I walked in, in there in the middle of the night, illegally with a flashlight, and I discovered it. And I was like, oh my god, we have to make this happen. I, knew, I had no idea what it was going to take. Well, you wanted to make an acting school or a theater? What did you a, want to do there? A theater. A theater. A theater. And, uh, and in the middle of the night, I felt, you know, I, I, I always love to tell the story because I had this epiphany, this electrical moment. I heard applause. I saw lights. <laughs> and I said, oh, my God, live theater needs to be in here. And then I tried to find out how, how can we get this space. And we have a 30-year lease. And Is it a black box, as they say? Well, it's two theaters. It's we, two black boxes. Yeah, we raised a million and a half. Ah. A lot of fundraising, lunches and dinners. So what happened? So the Santa Monica Museum moved to they Bergamot. Moved, right. And you had the space. And then does uh, Hans Rockenwager still have his restaurant? Yep, he has a great restaurant, five-star restaurant right next door. So you can so, have dinner, go to the Edgemar. What do you call it? the Edgemore Center for the Arts. Do the different stages have names? We have two different stages. We have, it's called the main stage and the second stage. I see. Steven Spielberg and Kate Cagshaw gave a gift for one of the stages. I see that, mm. I see that there's some uh, fundraising sources here where we can name a stage after somebody. We have, yeah, <laughs> we do have naming opportunities. So if anybody's out there and they want to come take great. a tour and, yep. I think that's really good, but now, you're, you're the artistic director there. Yes, so me and Larry Moss. And Larry Moss? Yeah. We're both artistic directors. So you just uh, chose a play called, Night, what is it, Night of the Black Cat? It's a cabaret play. Oh, it is. It's a cabaret, and there's 30 people on stage. And there's music, and there's dancing, and there's an interesting story. It takes place at the very beginning of French cabaret, like if you walked into a small cabaret in Montmartre. And uh, it's all smoky, and people are in garters, and there's Can Can, and there's Edith Piaf singing La Vie en Rose. We time travel through the 19th century. And it's a very entertaining show. It's a show that really was created from scratch, directed by just one of our great directors in LA called Deborah Levine. What else has she done? She has a ver great name in the she city. She does. She's directed at Deaf West Theater. She's directed Streetcar. Oh, right. She's won many awards. And she also directed a play that I was in years ago called The Rose Tattoo with Rob Estes oh. at the Hudson Theater. But and is it in French, Night of the Black Cat? Because you send out the invitation in French, say it. It's not, or, or Le Chat Noir, yes. but it's not in French. <laughs> it's, uh, but we have, uh, Edith Piaf sings a little bit in French and a little bit in English. But it's, uh, it's, it's in English. But is it really influenced by your time in France? Well, you know, I love, the, the whole thing started because I love French cabaret. Uh. And so I think it's, you know, I loved going to French cabaret and I find it so entertaining. How did you cast it? We cast it right out of people that we know, mostly out of the classes and people, oh. other performers oh. that came to audition. We held auditions. So it's like you're acting, theater is teaching, acting, putting on... Yes. Like we, a theater company. Absolutely. We don't have a, a formalized theater company because we're much more uh, collaborative, you know. Oh, I see. We don't just have a set group of people that we cast from. 
it's very open. But uh, people are certainly welcome and come all the time and put forth proposals and projects. So you'll take new material, you'll Absolutely. be doing all of that? Yes. It sounds really exciting. It is. It's a fun place. And it's great for the West, for Santa Monica to have a, a like off-Broadway, right? That's exactly <laughs> right. You can call up and say, what's playing tonight? And also we have an art gallery and we have a revolving art, art exhibits oh, you do? every two months. Oh, that's great. So, you, so it must be fun to be putting together your own complex. It is. It's been a dream. It's been a dream to have these two theaters because it's two theaters and a space for art and all of this under one roof. And you have, we have a lot of outreach programs for children. So on any given oh, okay. day, you walk in and there's a lot going on. In one theater, there's a rehearsal. In another theater, there's a class. You know, an artist is hanging their paintings. Children are singing. I mean, there's a lot, That's a lot of great. activity. Lots of cross-cultural. Yep. That's what I love the most. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks Thank you. for being with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And don't go away because we'll be right back with our poker expert, Richard Sparks. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Author Richard Sparks was born and raised in Wales, and his writing career actually started on Welsh TV. As he says, there was only one way to go, and that was up, I guess. <laughs> At the same time, he was writing plays, and he was reviewing theaters. Um, his work has been presented at universities, festivals, and theaters after which time you took a tour to New Zealand. What was that about? Uh, I was um, hired to be the script editor on a, an adventure series in New Zealand, 26-part adventure series of half-hour films. I ended up writing 23 of the 26 scripts. It was brutal. But, 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 but had you was, ever been there before? No, no. I was just, it, I'd worked for the production company in London, and they sent me to New Zealand, and we... Oh, it was the same production, it was the same production company, so they yes, knew you and they the, knew your work. Yes, I was just sent over there to, to do the writing. I mean, and what kind of um, show was it? It was a family adventure series called The Flying Kiwi, which is a dreadful title. And that was the name of the uh, old car that the kids drove around and had adventures in. Uh, it, was, it was a fantastic job, but it was very hard work. Did they give you the idea and yes. then you had to write oh, yeah. it all? Yes, it was another writer's idea and he was a book writer, not a script writer. Oh, so nice. I had to do all the script writing. And then in, in, for Welsh TV, what were you doing? Were you doing was, shows? No, I, well, I did some, but I started off, it was my first job after leaving Oxford University. I um, got a job writing the things that the announcers say between programs. That's what is, you were yeah, writing as a college graduate? It's, yeah, it's, it's pretty basic. And then I started making trailers, you know, things like, what was it in those days? Angie Dickinson in Policewoman and uh, oh, for, for Banachek and all these American shows that came the up. The American shows. Yeah. Was Very that glamour. fun? Yeah, it was wonderful. And then I, then I got a job writing uh, lines for a, a glove puppets that was a lump of coal in a haystack. It was a Welsh program in English. It was the in first English. thing they did. And they paid me £30 a half hour, which was $45. So but I got, script good, writing, I got script writing credits. That's and then when I went up to London, I had credits. And so I got an oh. agent and all that. Oh, so that's yeah. how it all started, and More then you less, went yeah. off to New Zealand. Well, at the same time, I was doing shows. I'd done shows at Oxford University the same period as people like Douglas Adams was at Cambridge, oh, who just yeah. died, who did Hitchhiker. He's a wonderful writer. And, and, and so I'm of that, of that generation, but, but, but after the Pythons, you know. Yeah, after the Pythons. Yeah. But did you look at them as, like, something they, they to were, emulate? They, they were our heroes. Well, I always wanted to do stuff that was wild and strange like they did, but what really happened to comedy after that was it became more satirical. There's a show called Not the Nine O'Clock News, which was very famous in England. Yeah, you mean once they right. finished that stupid well, the, comedy? Well, that, that, that wild surrealism was yeah. just up my street. And um, English comedy, after it, it took a roll backwards and became much straighter for a while. Now it's, it's wild again. But then when you went to New Zealand, did you take that genre, that yeah, idea well, I, with I, you? I wish I had been able to, but in fact, I was just doing a, an adventure series. So oh, it wasn't comedy. Th I put a few jokes in there. Did yeah. you? <laughs> well, I mean, for example, uh, the, the, we, ran out of act we ran out of money for actors for one episode. We couldn't have any new Is actors. Right? Yeah. So they said, can you write an episode just for the repertory? So I had to do the, 
you, you know, you've only got the family. How, how do you do an adventure without a villain? So I did The Boy Was Trapped in the Warehouse and he was dictating into his, into his tape recording, you know, day three, I'm dying of starvation and the family still so has a So that was the story? <laughs> yeah, and it was, it was a big budget production as well. But, <laughs> but So I got some comedy in there. You wrote this book, Diary of a Mad Poker Player, yes. which is current. Yes, very. We're talking yeah. about New Zealand years ago. Yes. And you were interested in poker then. When you left New Zealand, you got on the airplane, you were reading who, uh, Richard? No, David Spanier. David Spanier's book. became a great friend of mine and died a few years ago, um, sadly. He was a very great poker writer, and he was also a diplomatic correspondent of the Times in London. So he's a you know, respected writer. But that was what year? In the 80s, yeah, 90s? Early 80s? 80s yes. Okay, here he is writing about poker. Who was well, reading it? You must remember poker. You were reading it. Poker, no, but poker has a very long history in, in America. It's been played in this country for 200 years. I uh, know, but people don't pick up a book and read it about poker. Well, that was a how to book. That was an introduction to the strategy of the oh. game. My book's completely different because it's for the people who are enjoying watching it on television or people who are fascinated by what's going on. Why is this game so popular all of yeah, a sudden? Yeah, your, yours is so a I, diary. Well, I set out to do what the previous year's world champion had done, which was qualify on the internet, go to Vegas, and win the World Series. Oh, so but, but you were reading the how-to book back in the yeah, 80s. Yes, absolutely. So, yes. But were you also playing poker at that time? Occasionally, yes. There were some home games in England. And when I moved to California, lo and behold, there are card rooms here. How were you paying for all these <laughs> <laughs> poker games? <laughs> well, this is, a, this is the other difference between me and most other poker books, is they're written by professional poker players, and I'm a professional writer.